the things that you want to convey with your clothing and with your style are very different than the things that I want to convey. And it becomes really easy to see, especially older men. If you ever see an older guy that's in like his fifties and he looks like he's trying to dress like he's 18 or he's, he's in his mid twenties, it's because his wife is dressing him because for her being able to signal things like youth or maintain fertility or trendiness or relevance, those are, those are good from a female perspective. But from a male perspective, that makes you look like you're denying, like you haven't accomplished anything over the last 20, 30 years. And so you're still trying to hold on to all this untested potential as opposed to, no, I've, I've earned some status and I've made some, I've made some moves and I've, I've attained a certain level of of credibility and a certain level of status within my life. And I want to dress in a way that symbolizes that. Welcome to episode 123 of the Michaela Peterson podcast. In this episode, I spoke with men's style coach, author, and TEDx speaker, Tanner Guzzi. It was interesting because I feel the focus on men's fashion has shifted dramatically over the last few decades. And fashion is something every guy should know about and don't. It's so easy to look good, or at least look better, depending on how you dress. And you get treated so differently if you put a bit of effort into your appearance. It can be the difference between getting a job or not, or a relationship or not or being taken seriously, even if you don't know what you're talking about. It's important and many men don't know anything about fashion. We covered topics like how personality is expressed through style, choosing suits and shoes, the three archetypes of male fashion, husbands dressing for their wives, men wearing dresses. We also went into a bit of detail about Guzzi's personal life, the joys of parenthood, and his time spent as a missionary for the Church of Latter-day Saints. This was a pretty cool episode. I hope you guys enjoy it and have a good week. Tanner Guzzi, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me on, Mikhail. I'm excited to be here. It's nice to see you again. Yeah. This should be a fun conversation. Before (laughs) before we get into it, can you give a brief background about who you are and what it is you do? Yes. Yes. So Tanner Guzzi, I am based out of the Salt Lake City-ish area, uh, born and raised here. I am uh, a father of five, and I have one of the weirdest jobs in the world. I'm a men's style coach. So I teach guys how to dress better and why they should even give a crap about what their clothes are and how they look and how they present themselves with their grooming and all of that too. That's good. I think that's very important. (laughs) I think that's very important. I I guess we should start off by why does it matter? how you look. The biggest thing is because it is a, it's a way to express yourself, not only to the world around you, but also to change your own self-perception when it's done right. It's just as powerful as learning how to, uh, to read and write the, the ability to articulate yourself through your appearance is just as powerful and just as important as it is to do it with the written or the spoken language. I think that's fair. I think that's something that's underestimated right now but how much it matters and people care what you look like You're completely judged right right away. Yeah. And you should be because we're visual creatures and we can't take in, we can't treat people like they're blank slates. Like everything is completely open and there's no prejudgments or preconceptions. Now, obviously being mature means that you take that initial impression and then you reevaluate it based on new information that you get as you get to know people and you go through that process as well. But our brains would explode if we didn't have initial impressions of people based on how they looked or how they sound or all these other kind of patterns that we learn how to recognize. Yeah. What does it look like when you get started with a client? Do you go through their wardrobe? Do you suggest certain things based on how they already look? Yeah, I actually don't do a lot of suggestions until we get quite a ways into the program because I need to figure out who they are, how they f- see themselves fitting within the world and what the ideal version of them looks like, who, mm. how they want to communicate themselves to the people at work or their family or dating prospects or any of those things. And so we go through a pretty detailed process of discovering all that. A lot of it starts with what they have in their wardrobe. Uh, and then after we're done with that, then that's when I start making recommendations. But what's really cool is most of the time, I don't need to make that many recommendations because my guys get good enough with this on their own that they're making really good decisions by themselves. So you get people to look at an ideal version of themselves. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. So are there any style like complete no's? 
Like, how do you feel about bedazzled jeans? Can anyone make those look good? <laughs> well, okay. Here's the thing where it gets really interesting. And I guess we can continue to compare it to language or articulation is that you can think about some of those things like bedazzled jeans or Crocs or really baggy cargo shorts Crocs. or that kind of stuff. And right. And that's almost the equivalent of, of your swear words where there are very few times when it's appropriate to do it, but when it is, it's really appropriate to do it. But most of us overly rely on that kind of language and too many men overly rely on those types of clothes. And so you need to be, yeah, you need to be more specific with how you do it. How do you feel about Birkenstocks? Burks, I, honestly, man, there are some guys, especially when, when you're in kind of a coastal area, they can be a really cool kind of a beach look, or you can get a little kind of like new England wasp to it or something else. And so I think Burks, when they're done in the right context can end up looking pretty cool. Okay. Okay. What, what kind of person does, does every man need a good suit? What does a good suit look like? How does somebody tell when they're wearing a good suit? <laughs> okay. There's a lot of questions in that one. No, not every man needs a good suit anymore, which sucks because suiting used to be something that was kind of ubiquitous. And people really understood that when you were, if you were participating in Western civilization, if you were doing something that you wanted to communicate dignity and respect and self-mastery, any sort of credibility or authority, you would wear a suit. Yeah. But we've not only moved away from the idea of hierarchies in general, but we've also kind of split from rather being this big kind of homogenous Western culture into being a bunch of smaller tribes. And you get different cultures based on the industry that you work in or based on the music that you listen to or what your political ideology is, or even, you know, simple things like, are you an Apple or an Android guy and all this other kind of stuff. And so we've moved away from this homogenous culture into something that's a lot more tribe specific. And in so many of those wearing a suit is actually a big sign of being an outside an outsider. And so it makes you, it actually comes with ah. more liability than, than with more advantages to it. Wow. Wow. Okay. Wild, right? Yeah. I mean, you look at movies and videos of things in the fifties and everybody looked, I feel like people look better than they look now. And there's an aesthetic component that we miss for sure. And obviously the suit isn't the only way to do it because you go back 300 years and people looked good and healthy and strong and men looked like men and women looked like women. And it wasn't suits like we see it today. Or you go back to, you know, ancient Aztec culture or the Romans or, hmm. uh, you know, the Aborigines or anybody else. And we've always used clothing and there's always been an aesthetic component to it. And sadly, for so many of the these micro tribes that we're in, we're kind of caught up in this postmodernism where we reject beauty, we reject aesthetics. And in order to be able to signal that you're part of the group, that you understand the language, you have to embrace a level of ugliness and it, it sucks. Yeah. Do you think that's because people I've been torn about this. I assume that's because the general population has gotten more unhealthy. So just, we've gotten uglier as a whole. So it's like, why not mm -hmm. embrace it? Like potentially the fat acceptance movement is because people can't figure out how to lose weight. They don't understand that what they eat matters. They can't lose weight. So why not make it an acceptance move it, movement if you can't figure out how to change it? Yeah, I, I agree with that. And it's not even, I don't even think acceptance is, is correct with how far it's gotten. They call it fat acceptance, but it's really this like we're going to reject beauty. We're going to reject goodness. We're going to reject health so that you don't reject us. It's almost like, um, like the, the Aesop's uh, sour grapes fables of, you know, I just don't want those lower or those higher grapes because they're probably sour anyway, or it's Eminem in eight mile, you know, rapping about all of his weaknesses so that in that rap battle, the guy can't actually get anything else on him. It's this complete rejection of, of, these traditional standards. And if you, if I reject you first, you can't reject me. You know, you can't fire me. I quit type of thing. Oh, that could be it. Yeah. They shut down. Didn't they shut down Victoria's secrets this year? Victoria's secret, the runway show. Did you hear about that? Yeah. Yeah. And they started doing, again, you've got all this, uh, these kind of like anti-beauty beauty standards where it's all about, we're embracing all people at all size and all. And I get it. I mean, body acceptance is wonderful when you look at things like uh, you look at people who come back from war and they're missing limbs or burn victims or other things that really are, it's out of your control. You're born a certain way. And, and that, and honestly, even if you are, if you're, if you're fat and you can't control it, it doesn't mean you don't have any value as a person, but you're missing out on 
not only communicating your full value, but experiencing your full value. If you don't try and make yourself healthy and also in some way, aesthetically valid, if you don't try and make yourself beautiful as a woman or handsome as a man, you, you miss out on what your full potential is. Yes. People react to you differently too. Like even when, yeah. when I got healthy and I lost weight, people reacted to me differently dramatically, or I have blonde hair right now. and My hair is not naturally blonde. I get a completely mm -hmm. different reaction being blonde. Right. Yeah. And you're the same person, but do you also see yourself differently? Does, does your self-perception change a little bit when you see yourself in the mirror compared to before you were blonde or when you were bigger? Oh, definitely. Right. Yeah. It's huge. Yeah. It's huge. Okay. What tips do you have for people if they want to get started? So say, say that they've been focused on work or family and I wouldn't want, I don't want to say like, let things go, but just haven't prioritized how they look. How do you suggest people mm -hmm. get started or make it a higher priority? I would say the first thing to do for most men is go through your closet and throw out anything that has any sort of a graphic print on it, because you should not be basing your identity based on whatever product it is that you consume, or you should not be looking so apathetic that you're still wearing the t-shirt that your company hosted a 5k and you just got the t-shirt for free when you showed up to work that day. Like you should be projecting yourself as more than that. And so get rid of anything that has any graphics on it. And then from there, start to focus on pay attention to people around you, pay attention to those that look like they are that they're credible, that they're successful, that they're happy, that they're authoritative, that they're dignified, whatever the virtues are, that are the things that you want to emulate, pay attention to the people around you and look at people who look like they express those things and then start to emulate what those styles are, especially because it's different. It's different in Toronto than it is in Salt Lake, which is different than Nashville. And it's different if you work in tech versus if you're in a blue collar industry. And so there's not any specific, like just this one technical thing you can do, just like you can't say, you know, learn how to use these words if you speak French or if you speak English or you speak German, because the words all mean something different. And so you have to focus on what's the meaning you want to convey and how are the people in your world conveying that same meaning and start to emulate it from there. Does that make sense? That does make sense. That does make sense. Yeah. Look at what you're trying to convey. Look at people who are doing what you're trying to convey. Yeah. Yeah. That's smart. Okay. Hair. Do you have a hair tip styles, or does that completely <laughs> differ for people as well? Facial it hair differs too. a little bit. What's in right now? Right. That's a lot of questions. Man, oh, well, and, and, and again, right? No, you're good. <laughs> I love that question because it comes down to again, like we don't have this this kind of homogenous culture. It's the same thing with like, what are the trends that are coming down the pike? And I don't know, it depends. Are you, do you, are you into sports and what kind of sports are you into? Are you in this industry or that industry? But hair is different because hair and and, and beards are different because you actually have limitations. If you don't have a good set, a good head of hair, if you're starting to really lose it, honestly, just shave it and embrace the bald look. There aren't very many masculine ways to have a receding hairline that looks good on you. Same thing. If you've got a patchy beard that come, that doesn't come in great, sorry, with the way most of the world is right now, you can't do a goatee without looking like you're holding on to the nineties. And so you're better off either doing clean shaven or doing a full thing. But a lot of it is going to be dependent on on what your actual genetics and what your health markers are. But what a lot of guys really should be doing is using their grooming, their hair, their beard, uh, even their physique or their posture, their body language mm, yeah. as a way to kind of counter signal a lot of what they're doing with their clothing. Cause what most men do is they get really one dimensional with their appearance. It's I'm, I'm, you know, you go back to the high school stereotypes of I'm a jock. And so everything about me looks like the jock or I'm a nerd. And so everything about me looks like a nerd and a fully established adult man should be multidimensional. And so you should be able to look really clean in a suit, but maybe you've got a beard and long hair. And so it's like, Oh, this is a little bit more interesting because he isn't so perfectly polished. Or maybe you've got you know, a really big build because you're strong and you've taken good, good care of yourself in the gym. And, and so you dress in a way that's a little bit more friendly and inviting instead of intimidating, or you have some fat and some weight to lose. And so you dress in a way that counter signals that, yes, I still am disciplined and I'm dignified and I still pay attention to the details, even if my physique isn't exactly where I want it to be either, but create some multidimensionality between all of these aspects of how you present yourself to people. When you're trying to give people style advice, do you also work on physique and diet and lifestyle? 
uh, I usually partner up with other coaches to kind of point them towards that. And a lot of times, most of my clients are guys who come in and they're already halfway through that journey. They see the value yeah. of it. And that's when they decide they want to start working on the clothing aspect of it too. Okay. But yeah, it's a huge aspect. Honestly, the biggest thing that you can do to improve your appearance has nothing to do with clothes. It's getting better shape. That, that That's the biggest thing you could do. Yeah. You see people at fashion shows and they're wearing curtains, right? Like it just looks terrible. And you're like, oh no, that was unique, stylish. It's like, no, that person was hot. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it, exactly. Yeah. Do you find that men are dressing less masculine and are we just headed continually heading in that direction? Because I've seen like, People are showing up in dresses now. I'm not sure how I feel yeah. about that. I don't think I feel good <laughs> about it. I'm open no. though, like do whatever, but I don't find it attractive, but like what's going on there. Yeah. I think we're seeing two different movements. You're seeing this move towards androgyny and that's where you get a lot of the dresses. You get a lot of the high fashion, you get a lot of kind of the urbanites and it's almost along kind of political or ideological lines mm -hmm. where this idea of androgyny and men or women are interchangeable and there's not, there not that many differences and then at the same time, on the other hand, you get this kind of like anti-aesthetic aesthetic of you're going to have to pry my cargo shorts and my 80s metal t-shirt and my combat boots out of my cold, dead hands because there's no way I'm ever going to wear anything besides that. Oh, yeah. Neither, neither of those are ideal. Exactly. And both of them become kind of caricatures of, of what they really could be or should be. And we've rejected the idea of there being a deliberate and intentional and at the same time, masculine way to dress because we either reject masculinity and embrace fashion or embrace trends or embrace androgyny, or we reject aesthetics and embrace masculinity. But we treat both of these as if they're mutually exclusive and they're not. How did you get started doing this? Man, I, <laughs> so the early, the early story of it is I went to a private school when I was seventh, eighth grade, sixth grade, stuff like that. Had to wear the gray dress slacks, the white shirt, the rep stripe tie, the Navy blazer, the whole thing. I was really, really, this was like mid nineties. I was really big into punk rock and BMX bikes and snowboards and all of that. And so I wanted green Liberty spikes and I wanted Amazing. battle jackets, right? <laughs> like just the complete opposite as far as an aesthetic. And especially you go back to like the nineties gutter punk and it was very in your face. And I couldn't wear that when I was in school or my friends that were my friends that I would ride bikes with would see me come home from school and they would make fun of me because I was wearing my private school clothes. And so I learned from experience pretty early on how much appearance has to do with identity and how much it has to do with shaping your own sense of who you are and also how people perceive you. And then that was something that was kind of in my pocket for a long time. I dealt with it when I was serving as a missionary for my church in Toronto, actually. So kind of in your home, your hometown and uh, had to wear a suit and a tie all the time and the way people perceive me there. And so about 10 years ago, I realized that I was interested in it. I wanted to write about something. I was sick about writing about politics or anything. And so I started a little blog called Masculine Style and it's picked up momentum. And here we are 10 years later and I get to do this full time. That's very cool. Okay. Can we talk about missionary work? Are you comfortable? Yeah, absolutely. That? Okay. So yeah, yeah, no, yeah, absolutely. Give me a background on that. We'll take this conversation in a slightly different direction. What brought cool. you to Toronto and what were, what were you doing exactly? Yeah. So I'm a member of the church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And what we do is for young men, uh, you have a commitment where you go out and you serve a full-time mission for two years. I'm sure you've seen the guys with like the black name tags on their chest and they're wearing the white shirts and the suits and all that. Yep. So you go do that for two years. Uh, when I went, you went when you were 19. Now they have guys go a little bit younger, but you don't get to pick where you go nor do you get to pick the language that you speak. You just open up uh, an envelope that says, this is where you're going. And when you leave and when you come back and here's the language you're speaking. Wow. Okay. Yeah. That's intense. And so I got, Toronto, it's okay, intense. that's pretty good then. That could have been weird. Yeah. Right. Well, and I have, you know, I have one of my brothers served in the Czech Republic. Another one was supposed to serve in Haiti, but because of the unrest there, he ended up going to Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Oh, I have cousins at Haiti or right? Fort like Lauderdale. All, okay. Exactly. Right. But I mean, I've had cousins that have served in like the sticks of Panama or people that have been in Russia. Like you really can go kind of anywhere, almost to the point where I remember being a little bit disappointed that I was going to Canada because all of your friends go to all these exotic places and they get to do it in a, in a whole different way. But I got to speak Spanish, which helped. It helped kind of make it feel a little bit different. And I fell in love with the city and I fell in love with 
with being able to learn how to express myself in Spanish. And it was, it was a hard two years for sure. I mean, you, uh, you're doing it full time. You're not dating. You're not going, not going to school. You're not working. Uh, when I was out, wow. I got two phone calls a year with my family. I call them on Christmas and on mother's day. And other than that, it was emails once a week and you were in the trenches. Like it's, it's a full on monk mode, rite of passage. And you're talking to people about religion and you're trying to help them see what religion is and what a relationship with God and Christ can be. And, and to hopefully join the, join the church. And it's, it's intense. Yeah. And I feel like people in Toronto also aren't particularly religious. Yeah, we dealt with, uh, I couldn't tell most of the time if people hated me more for being a Latter-day Saint or for being an American, but we, we dealt with a lot of resentment from a lot of people. Wow. At 19. That's pretty, Yeah, that's interesting. That's interesting. It's so good for you. I can't wait for my son to go do it. It's just, it's so good for you because you learn how you learn how to do hard things. You learn how to deal with social pressure and apprehension. You learn how to deal with discipline. You learn how to deal with it. It's so good for you in so many ways. It's gotta be scary. You learn how to de oh, yeah. deal with people who don't want to talk to you. That's scary. Oh yeah. I mean, imagine going and sitting down by somebody on the bus and you know, they don't want to talk to you because they recognize the name tag and they know what you're all about. And then trying to, to speak to them in Spanish or some language that you started learning five weeks ago. It's terrifying. And it's so good for you because it's so terrifying. Oh, wow. That's intense. Yeah. Okay. Well, that makes sense. And you said they do it earlier now. How do you make money? Yeah. They said you get like a, an amount of money you get a year or something to survive. You off actually, of? you, you pay to do it. What? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Well, now I know. <laughs> okay. Do you, do you talk about style archetypes at all? I do. Yeah. In fact, I have three that I break it down to. Ooh, you want to go through those? Let's get into those. Yeah. Okay. This is really good because the archetypes really help people to understand. I think one of the big mistakes that, that we currently make is that we see style as something that creative people, whether that's designers or the people at magazines or influencers, something else that they create. And then we adopt. And, you know, it's kind of like the fight club, like you're not your khakis type of thing. But what style really is, is you start with who you are on the inside and then you express that externally through your clothing. So it starts inside and moves out as opposed to starting outside and moving in. And in order to do that correctly, you have to identify where you fall within these particular archetypes. And I work with three of them. So you've got rugged, refined, and rakish. Really easy to remember the three R's. Okay. And what this is, is how you interact with the world around you. So the guys who are primarily rugged, they interact with the world through physical means. And it may be kind of the stereotypical association of like the lumberjack or the blue collar worker or the cowboy, or it may be somebody who's more just like a musician or a triathlete or somebody that still engages in the world physically. And they're happiest when they're doing things physically. And so you start to dress in a way that expresses that. The refined guys are guys who understand systems and hierarchies and social pecking orders and all of that. And they thrive by being able to play by the rules, climb the ladder, get on the good side of the boss, network the right way. And they're, they're really good at understanding and following the rules. And that's how they can kind of thrive within society. And you dress in a way that reflects that as well. And then the rakish guys, they understand that hierarchy just as well as the refined guys, but they thrive by going against it, by throwing a big middle finger to it and rejecting it. And so they dress in a way that reflects that as well. And it's fun as you start to see these different archetypes and everybody has all three of them, but you also get them in different ratios. You know, most guys will be primarily one or even two more so than all three. But as you start to dress in a way that reflects those in the proper ratios, you feel incredibly congruent and authentic in what your style is, because it feels like, you know, when you see yourself in the mirror, what you see actually looks like how you feel as yeah. opposed to there being this dissonance between the two of them. Yeah. Yeah. I feel that. Okay. Yeah. One, one comment when I got healthy, that's how I felt. I can remember looking, right? yeah, I can remember looking in the mirror before I got really sick and being like, well, I look better than I feel. And then it started to like, even the playing field where <laughs> I was like, oh no, I'm looking kind of how I feel. Uh, and then, yeah, things things weren't so good. Okay. This, right. this rakish style. So how do you yeah. go, how do you go against what other people are doing and still end up stylish? What's an example? It depends on what your tribe is because, you know, if you live in the suburbs of Utah, 
And most of the guys around me in my neighborhood, they work in the tech industry. So they're wearing just kind of plain t-shirts and they're, they've got shortly cropped hair and they're wearing uh, simple skinny jeans and, and t-shirts or, and sneakers, even for me, just having longer hair and having a fuller beard and looking like I pay more attention to my style looks more rakish. You get into urban environments and you get a lot of like streetwear and the sneaker heads and that kind of stuff. And that's incredibly rakish. You can go into more of a rock and roll type style that you would see. Um, depending on the decade, whether it's like the Beatles were rakish because of the way that they dress, you certainly can get into punk rock or metal or a lot of the stuff that guys will wear when they're doing music videos or they're on stage and that's rakish. And honestly, even if it were something as simple as everybody in your office wore a white shirt and you showed up to work wearing a blue one, that's rakish in and of itself too. So it has a lot more to do with a comparison to the people around you than there being any objective standard of, of what rakishness is. Okay. Say you're, that makes sense. Say you're trying to hide a part of you, like make one area bigger, one area smaller, or you're bigger than you want to be. And you want to be slimmer. Let's, let's start with that one. If you're bigger than you want to be and you want to appear slimmer, what are the, what style advice do you have for those guys? We're talking about hiding yourself and all that, just like from a fear, a pure physical component, not like my presence is bigger, but my body is bigger. And I want to, yeah, physical, just physical. Gotcha. Okay. Uh, a couple of easy ways to do that. And a lot of this, I'm sure, you know, because the, the same rules kind of apply to women, you wear solids and dark colors. You have minimal uh, transition between what you look like on top and what you look like on the bottom. So if you're doing a more monochromatic look, that helps vertical mm-hmm. stripes can do a lot of good where it draws people's eyes in and draws them up so that they can kind of slim you out there. And then for a lot of men, Um, especially because most of us, when we're bigger than we want to be, we tend to carry more weight in our stomachs and in our love handles and kind of right there through the midsection. And so what you want to do is you want to find shirts that they fit nice and snug in the chest and the traps, the shoulders and the upper arms. So it almost looks like you're so jacked that you're kind of nice and snug through there, but then it's a little bit looser with a little bit more drape down through the waist and through the seat kind of in that midsection area, because one, it hides that. And then two, it also draws all this visible attention to your shoulders and your upper body instead. And so it artificially creates that V shape that that's the most masculine aesthetic and that most of us are after. Okay. That's good. How do you feel about square toed shoes? <laughs> I'm so glad that trend is dead. That one is so bad. <laughs> it's there's, there's nothing aesthetic about it. They were just ugly and they were a trend at a certain, Oh, I'm so glad they're gone. Okay. That's kind of how I, feel. <laughs> that's one of those, like one of the few four letter words in the aesthetic world that that's, yeah, you just don't ever say, <laughs> you don't ever say four uh, square toed shoes. You, you, there's, there's no excuse that makes those work. I mean, yeah, maybe you go back 25 years ago and, and they would have worked then because that was what was expected, but they're terrible. If you own them, get rid of them today. Okay. I'm, <laughs> I'm glad, I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, so Crocs, well, how do you feel about those sandals that are super strappy? Those have got to go too, right? The ones that Wait, have a whole bunch of about? straps. Just, I feel like they're called, I just know them because my dad used to wear them all the time. And like the Harachas. Oh no. I feel like I went into a, an area that you like. I don't know what a Haracha is. What's a Haracha? They're kind of like they're made. Oh, I think they're made in Southern Mexico. Um, or like, uh, Central America, upper South America, but they've got a bunch of different straps all over them. And those, if you're in the right environment, kind of like Birkenstocks can end up being really cool, but they're tough to pull off in the right way. I gotta, I gotta find photos of what your dad used to wear so that I can, I can tell him if he's doing a good job with them or not. They were pretty bad. I think they were closed toed, but they just had a lot of straps. Anyway, (laughs) uh, you, so you'd put the strappy sandals in the same category as Birkenstocks. No, the, the Harachas, same thing with okay. like espadrilles. Do you remember Tom's when those were really big yeah. like 10 years ago? Yeah. Yeah. Those are an espadrille and those have like a classic Spanish origin where it's almost like a slipper with the rope sole. And if you're in a coastal area and it's summer, you can do those and do them really well. You know, if you're, if you're in Florida or you're in Spain or Ibiza or, you know, like you've got a lot of different options that you can do stuff like that. And those Birkenstocks, Harachas, espadrilles, way better than most flip-flops. Okay. That's fair. That's fair. Um, what recommendations do you have for people who are, I know, I know this is going to differ depending on where the person's located, but if you're trying to impress mm-hmm. somebody on a date and exude confidence, what kind of outfit goes with that? So the biggest thing that I would say is wear something, obviously it needs to be 
you know, context appropriate for what it is that you're doing on the date and where you live time of time of year and all of that. But the biggest thing that I would say is wear something that makes you feel like you're on fire, makes you feel like you're the best version of yourself. Sadly, what a lot of men do is when they're getting ready to go out on a date, they put on something that part of their brain goes, this looks good and I should feel good in it. But then the other part feels really self-conscious. Am I trying too hard? Does this not fit right? Is, am I, you know, is this too ostentatious? Am I, am I calling for too much attention? And so they have this internal battle that's happening subconsciously the whole time and remove that. Don't wear something that a date is the wrong time to experiment with something new. You should already be really comfortable in what you're wearing so that it almost feels like you're putting on a social version or an aesthetic version of what your battle armor is so that you can go in and you can be totally mentally and emotionally freed up to focus on what you're doing on the date, as opposed to that nagging in the back of your head the whole time that you're out there. Okay. That makes sense. Uh, have you seen what kind of different style can make to somebody's love life? Like, have you seen somebody without like losing weight, say with just changing how they dress? Have you seen what difference that can make? It's massive, especially for, for married men. Um, I mean, it's huge for guys that are in the dating market. A lot of my clients are kind of young guys that work in the tech space and for them to not only see themselves as now multidimensional, but actually carry themselves with some level of confidence. It makes dating so much easier, but especially for men that are married and they've been in a relationship for a long time because your wife doesn't want to dress you. She doesn't want to see you as another one of the kids that she has to now think about this and she has to choose your clothes. I mean, it's so emasculating and it kills the respect that she can have for you. She wants you to look good. And that's why she chooses to dress you because dressing you is better than you looking like garbage. But what's even better is if you can dress yourself in a way that looks attractive and it looks dignified and it looks self-respecting. And she knows that who she knows on the inside, this person that she's in love with, this person that she spent all these years with, that that's what she sees when she sees, you know, she posts you up on social media, or that's what she sees when you guys go do family photos for that year or whatever it is that you kind of get these versions of it, that she's proud to have you to be on your arm when you go out on a date or when you go out, you know, with friends in the neighborhood or you go grab drinks and she's not embarrassed that you're saying it changes her whole perception of you, your respectability, your own sense of self. And it, it's, it's massive. Okay. That was good. So no square toed shoes. <laughs> no square toe. We'll just go back to that yeah, one. Yeah. <laughs> I think that that's, that's really important because I have friends too that will help their significant other mm -hmm. to dress, but it's entirely because they're like, you cannot wear that. You cannot right. wear that and be seen with me wear this instead. Right. But that's a pretty low bar. You're like aiming for something a bit higher up. Exactly. Well, and a big part of it too, is that women and men have different aesthetic goals when we get dressed, the things that you want to convey with your clothing and with your style are very different than the things that I want to convey. And it becomes really easy to see, especially older men. If you ever see an older guy that's in like his fifties and he looks like he's trying to dress like he's 18 or in he's, he's in his mid twenties, it's because his wife is dressing him because for her being able to signal things like youth or maintained fertility or trendiness or relevance, those are, those are good from a female perspective. But from a male perspective, that makes you look like you're denying, like you haven't accomplished anything over the last 20, yeah. 30 years. And so you're still trying to hold on to all this untested potential as opposed to, no, I've, I've earned some status and I've made some, I've made some moves and I've, I've attained a certain level of, of credibility and a certain level of status within my life. And I want to dress in a way that symbolizes that. And so that's one of the biggest differences in the way that men and women dress. And another reason why you shouldn't let most women dress you. Oh, that's really good advice. Do you think there's a way for people who are younger? So say you're younger at a job. Is there a benefit in dressing like some of the older people? Only if you've earned some level of status. Uh, this is why you can get... I'm going to pick on these guys because it's so obvious, but you get like the college Republicans that they dress up in their suits and they just look, they just look so dorky in the way that they do it. And it's because there's this disparity between how young and untested, how... They don't have any credibility. They don't have any experience. They don't have any mastery, but the suit still, because we as a culture are not so far removed that it doesn't have any symbolism to us, to us, it still represents that. And so it's, it's basically, I'm relying on my clothing to signal something that I, that isn't actually consistent with who I am. And so oh. the easiest way for young guys to be able to dress well in a work environment 
is to not dress up more formally or to not emulate the guys that are at the absolute like top of the echelon, but dress like everybody else that's in your same kind of tier, but make sure your stuff fits better. Focus on simpler colors and make sure that you buy higher quality versions of it. Because even though people won't be able to quantify the difference between like a $20 shirt that you picked up at a department store and a hundred dollar custom shirt, you, they will see the difference, even if they can't pinpoint what it is. And you will, you will be seen as somebody who still is young and understands his position, but has potential and is, and is doing more than everybody else around him. And so it becomes this very subtle way of communicating that to the, to the people at work. Ah, okay. So be more subtle, be yeah. high quality. Okay. That's good advice. Yep. Uh, how much do people, how do you do this on a lower budget? How do you look good on a lower budget? Um, the biggest thing is it's still possible, but you just have to focus on keeping things simple and keeping things that fit well, fit well, while still sending the right signals, depending on where you are and what you do. A lot of guys. Okay. One of the biggest mistakes that beginners make when they start trying to dress better is they associate dressing better with dressing more formally. So, you know, if everybody at work is in jeans and a t-shirt, then I'm going to show up in slacks and a button up shirt. You don't dress more formally. You stay at the same level of formality as everybody else. Um, they focus a lot on color where it's, I have to have all this new color to be able to bring in because then I stand out and I look different or they focus on pattern, um, which is, you know, I, 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 the number of guys who I know that resent the idea of wearing just like a plain white or a plain blue shirt to work, whether that's a t-shirt or a polo or a button shirt, they hate it because then that feels so conformist. It feels so small. And so they end up wearing a pattern shirt and they don't ever pay attention and look around them and realize that everybody else is also wearing pattern shirts because they're trying to stand out. And so ignore, ignore formality, ignore color, ignore pattern, focus on fit, focus on quality to the best that you can afford, and then focus on simplicity because you want your clothing to be, you want it to be the frame of the painting and you're the painting itself. You're, you're what people are paying attention to. Whereas too many guys become the mannequin for the clothing. And they're all about showcasing the clothes instead of it going the right way. Okay. What are your favorite, uh, for lack of a better term, lower end, cheaper clothing brands? Okay. So here in the States, um, honestly, you can do pretty well, even if you go shop at somewhere like Target. Uh, they're good fellow and co. Uh, they're like kind of house line. They do a pretty good job as far as fit and keeping things simple and keeping things relevant without either being too trendy or too, uh, too outdated. They do a good job. Um, if you're younger, then you can have some luck at H and M, but it's really hard to avoid all the kind of crazy out there, uh, egregious stuff. And then same thing with places like Zara where avoid like the hyper skinny fits or the really ostentatious stuff, but you can find, you can find good looking stuff at, at those places and do it for relatively cheap. Now, I'm also uh, like take advantage of outlets, go to the J crew outlet, go to banana Republic outlet, go to the, go to the polo outlet. And, uh, and you can do really well on, on a pretty good budget with brands like that too. Okay. What about shoes? Shoes. You can't do it cheap and do it. Well, uh, you got to invest in it. It's worth it because not only is it good from an aesthetic perspective, because cheap shoes look cheap and it's really apparent to anybody who knows what they're paying attention to, but it's terrible from a health perspective. You're going to kill your, you're going to kill your posture. You're going to kill the way your arches are. Your feet are going to get too, too cramped and that, that can start to lead to, you know, ankle issues or knee issues or back problems or anything else. And so shoes are one of those things that it's not worth going cheap on invest that the invest in the best you can afford with those go cheaper on pants and shirts. If that means buying higher quality shoes. Okay. What about accessories? Man, accessories. Okay. Totally different with men because with women, mm -hmm. You can buy accessories purely for the sake of aesthetics. Does it look good? Does it make me look beautiful? Does it make me look, does it make me look better for men? We don't have that way of doing it. Accessories have to have some sort of meaning to them. You can't just like pick them up on the impulse aisle as you're getting ready to check out the, at checkout at the store. It has to have some sort of meaning or symbolism to it. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. So it has to have a use, right? Right. Well, not even necessarily like a, like a functional use, but it can be something like, um, you know, maybe you get yourself, uh, maybe you get yourself a good watch or a particular uh, bracelet or a necklace or something else to commemorate a big milestone. You know, I'm about to hit five years of being self-employed. And so I'm looking at good Rolexes for me to be able to kind of have that as something nice. that I can celebrate that way. Um, so if it commemorates something that you've done, 
Uh, if it's something that you picked up on travel, that's a, a that's a really good reason to have an accessory where, it, you know, it's kind of telling a story that, hey, I picked this up while I was surfing in Costa Rica or I did this as part of, uh, you know, a trip to the Mediterranean or whatever else. If there's a story that's associated with it, um, if there's some sort of family history to it where, you know, these are the cufflinks that my grandpa wore at his wedding mm-hmm. and I got them at my wedding and I can wear them now. Or if you inject some sort of symbolism to it, like I've got a big signet ring that has a lot of religious significance to it. And so anything that has some sort of like religious or philosophical symbolism um, that when you see it, it reminds you of something, then you can get away with wearing accessories that way. So it has to have some sort of either physical social or psychological purpose in order to pull off something like a bracelet, a necklace, a ring or something else. Okay. So seashell necklaces. (laughs) Welcome back to 1998. (laughs) Yes. I mean, again, if you're, you know, if you're, if you're doing a, a surf tour, surf tour down in Jamaica and you happen to be living there for the next eight weeks or eight months because you're a digital nomad, by all means, embrace it, make it part of your style when you go back to wherever it is that you are, but don't just pick them up because that's what you see on somebody's Instagram feed. And you think it looks cool. It has to have more meaning to it than that for you. Okay. Got it. Uh, what about favorite high-end brands? What are the best of the best and which ones are, are expensive, but no good. Oh, okay. So for the most part, expensive, but no good is really the couture brands um, where you're buying, you're buying status without it really coming in as far as quality. So stuff like Gucci or Louis Vuitton or any of this uh, Hermes, this stuff. And I mean, a lot of it, sure. It can be decent from a quality perspective, but again, what you're doing is you are, you're swapping your identity from being something that's self-created and self-made into my identity is based on my consumption of this particular product that you have to see my Gucci belt or my mule loafers, or you have to see, you know, my Tom Ford sunglasses. And that's, that's how you know that I'm a worthwhile person is because I'm attaching myself to this particular brand. And so you want more subtlety in the luxury that you're buying. And so that's going to be though. (laughs) <laughs> right. And I mean, again, if you're getting rakish with some stuff, there's ways to do it right. There are ways to be able to play it right. But for most guys, they overly rely on this where it's just, they don't have anything else going for them. And so they, they try to create an identity based on this, the stuff that they're buying or, or wearing or consuming. So there are ways to do it, but, but not necessarily the biggest trick to this, even if it's not necessarily high end, because it depends. I mean, $200 for a suit is not high end. But $200 for a decent t-shirt is pretty dang high end. And uh-huh. so it depends on what you're buying and what it is that you're in. But what I what I recommend most guys get familiar with, and this is one of the benefits of the time that we live in now. You go to a department store like a Macy's or a Nordstrom or even like a JCPenney or a Kohl's or a Dillard's or something else. And they have to appeal to as many people as possible in order to make in order to be profitable because they're they're focused on a particular like actual physical storefront and what the people are that come in mm-hmm. and buy from them internet changed everything with that with online brands you can have brands that cater to a very specific body type or a very specific aesthetic or a very specific uh, desire for it being, you know, made in the USA or it's untreated cotton or all these other things because now they can sell to a global market And so they can actually still be profitable without being limited to what the geography is. And so the biggest thing is to find the brands that work for you based on the signals that you want to send, based on what works for your body, and then be really loyal to those brands so that you can go out and continue to buy stuff and support them. And then the stuff's going to look really good on you. So like for me, one of my favorite brands is a company called Buck Mason. They're based out of California. Where did that? And I love the fit on their stuff. It fits me perfectly. I love the way that it feels. Uh, the quality of it is really good. And the price point is enough that it feels premium, but it also doesn't feel like, uh, you know, I got to save up to, to get something from these guys. And so it checks all these boxes for me really well. And what's cool is that that's all subjective for every man. And it's worth it to find out what the brands are, uh, that, that it's worth being loyal to in that regard. Okay. And then, so you talked about Gucci and how some people overdo it on that just for status. Is that different when you're buying something like the Rolex watch because it's not a main piece? How does, how do you differentiate between when it's status seeking or not? Good question. I like that. Okay. So I would say that there's two things to that. 
the first one, yeah, I think you're totally right that it depends on how much attention it draws. Mm -hmm. Okay. Cause if it's a giant t-shirt, that's just, you know, almost crassly blaring it in your face, that's very different than being something that's a little bit subtle. I think that's why Gucci loafers or something can be a little bit more so because they're in a little bit more subtle location. And then the other thing too, has to do with, oh man, Michaela, there's so many things that go into this. Okay. <laughs> because part of it has to do with your archetypes. The more rakish you are, then the more you can, the more you can kind of command that, that attention. And the more you can do it that way, uh, the higher your status is within either your respective tribe or just kind of society in general, the more you can get away with. Uh, I always use Conor McGregor as a good example of this, where he can wear this kind of stuff because it's actually this like giant middle finger go to hell attitude to what the MMA community used to be, where it was all like the tap out stuff and, and the affliction stuff. And he comes in wearing couture stuff or wearing well-fitted suits that have these big patterns. And, but he could only do it because he was, he's good enough as a fighter that he can back it up. Some kid that's just brand new and isn't mm -hmm. winning any bouts. He's not, he's not actually winning any fights. If he dresses like that, it's a joke. So your relative mastery or status within a particular organization comes into play there too. And then the, the other thing to factor in is even like Rolex, for an example, is how much of a status signal is something within a particular tribe versus within society in general. Cause I mean, if you show up with a Submariner, like a really big flashy Rolex, most people are going to recognize that for what it is, but you show up with the one I'm looking at is like a 1984 uh, blue dial date just and for most people that I'm around, they're never even going to know what it is. But to the people that are in kind of like my menswear tribe or my entrepreneurial tribe, they're going to recognize it for what it is. And they're going to, going to be able to appreciate it in a different way. Ah. So there's all these little things that come into play with it. And it can sound really complex and complicated. But again, it's the same thing with language where you learn what jargon you can use. I mean, we see this on different uh, online communities and how... Uh, your, your different nomenclature, these words mean this, or those words mean that. And, and it's almost this kind of like intra tribal in order to bring people in and we communicate between us. And at the same time, exclude the people that aren't like us. Yeah. Um, it kind of serves both of these functions. And so a lot of clothing accessories, all of that has those same, those same functions too. Okay. That makes sense. That's all good. Um, what are your, I mean, you can even see that historically where, um, like the whole idea of you don't wear white, um, but except between Memorial Day and Labor Day, yeah. that was just to separate old money from new money, where the new money didn't get those rules. And so it was a way for the old money to be able to like exclude them. Same thing with um, you don't wear black, you don't mix black and brown with formal wear. That was a British aristocracy thing that when you were out in your country house, you wore brown. And when you were in the city, you wore black. And so it was really crass to mix the two of them because it was indicative of the fact that you didn't have a country estate that you could, you could go to. You didn't understand the social nuances of what the aristocracy were and how they operated. And so it was this very specific way of we're us and you're them. And we create these arbitrary rules to keep it separate. And the more complicated and the more limited those rules are the happier we are about it nice i hadn't heard about that don't wear white until i don't even know what it is you said memorial day and labor day i'm canadian i don't yeah, know so you can't wear it yeah you can't wear it until memorial day and you can't wear it after labor day so it's a summer only color white yeah <laughs> okay and <what> is <laughs> right somebody told me that this year i was like what are you talking about what year is that from <laughs> when did that stop being a thing is it still a yeah. thing I, well, it depends. I mean, if you're up in new England, if you're up at Montauk or something, that's still a thing, but for the, for most of the rest of us, not really. And that was just, that was what like rich people knew about. Mm -hmm. oh. There was arbitrary rules that they created to separate the old wealth from the new wealth. Interesting. So you can find out what all those rules are and then copy them, sneak your way yep. in. And, and whether you like it or not, you exist in a world that has those rules. If you work at Facebook, you have rules like that. You don't show up to work in a suit. You get laughed out of the room. You, it doesn't matter where you work or what you do. If you go to your landscaping job and you're wearing something that's a little bit too skinny or it's a little bit too high quality and they're going to poke fun at you, they're going to, they're going to. And so you get this men intuitively get this because we're constantly evaluating the, the hierarchy. And ever since we were teenagers, we've understood that clothing is a part of it. And what I want men to, to start to do is do that more intentionally as opposed to reactionally or reactively. Mm. Yeah. 
Do you think this has a lot, like you paying attention to style like this, do you think this has a lot to do with personality versus people who are like, nah, I don't care. This is comfortable. <laughs> um, I think to some extent it does. Um, and, you know, if you kind of like to nerd out on social dynamics or if you like to understand how people work, I think to a large extent being more in like the refined or the rakish archetypes, you're going to have more of a propensity to go this way because it does fall so much within understanding dynamics and human interaction and all of that. Uh, what I would argue though, is for the vast majority of men who just kind of, oh, I don't care. Uh, you challenge them to do something like, okay, wear a pink dress for the next week and tell me if you don't feel different and tell me if you actually don't care. But for them, the, the caring is in the not caring. Their antipathy is just as emotional of a reaction to their clothing as somebody else's affinity to it is. And very few men actually have a true indifference mm -hmm. to what their appearance is. Mm -hmm. And I'd argue that it's not even about what you care about. It's about how society perceives you and you don't have a lot of control over that. So you can say, oh, this doesn't matter. This is my style, but it's going to mm -hmm. deeply affect everything you do. Totally. And so why, why handicap yourself when you can yeah. use it to your advantage instead? Yeah. It's like life hacks, these things. Mm -hmm. And it, it's crazy. And yeah. I, I remember reading about Marilyn Monroe and she said she, cause she had her an insane style, right? With her hair right. and her winged eyeliner and her lipstick. She had something really serious going on. And she said she could just turn that off. She just dressed in a completely different way. And nobody would recognize her. Yeah. Right. So it's like, have you seen Zoe De Chanel without bangs or glasses? Yeah. Like you, you don't even recognize her, right? Yeah. Yeah. And it's the whole idea of Clark Kent in Superman. And the only difference is he's in a suit and he has glasses on and the little curly coif is gone and that's it. But it really, we get so used to seeing people certain ways that it does become a different identity as soon as you start to change it. Yeah. And I suppose for people who are interested in, like I, I talked to Robert Green recently and he does the art of mm -hmm. seduction. That was a really fun yeah. conversation. Uh, if you're interested in how to like maneuver your way in social situations and conversations and what you should say and how you should act, then you should also be interested, very interested in how you look. Absolutely. And he obviously understands that. I mean, you look at like the 48 laws of power and you look at men like Napoleon or Washington or Machiavelli and how much these men understood the importance of appearance. Washington, I'm going through a biography on him right now. It's insane the amount of time and energy that he put into not only his appearance, but that of his whole household and even that of his troops, because he, he understood the value of it, not only in the social dynamics, but also in the self-perception component too. So yeah, that wouldn't surprise me at all that Green would understand that. That's very interesting. I bet that corresponds, because I was thinking maybe it's extroversion. I like personality. But I was mm -hmm. like, maybe it's extroversion you wanting to fit in or pick up on other people, but maybe it's also conscientiousness. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Cool. Okay. Tanner, where can people find you online if they want more help? Do you, do you get clients specifically? Do you do this online? Yeah. Yep. Yep. So if you want to reach out to me, uh, the best place to be able to kind of Find me and connect us through uh, social media. I'm most active on Twitter and Instagram, and it's at Tanner Guzzi. So T-A-N-N-E-R-G-U-Z-Y. Uh, the main site that you can look me up on is masculine-style.com. And that's where you can look at more coaching and all of that. And then also I've published a book on this called The Appearance of Power. And uh, you can find that on Amazon. And we've got an audible version of it, uh, Kindle, paperback, all of that. So if you want to kind of well, you know, cut your teeth on the general concepts. That's a really good place to start, but I love being able to chat with people online. My DMS are open. And so, uh, come, come talk to me on there. Uh, I do a lot of this stuff, especially on Instagram to showcase what a lot of these principles are, because I know with a conversation like this, a lot of this can, can sound kind of heady. And it's a whole lot easier to understand these concepts when I'm showing visual examples. And so Twitter and Instagram are really good places to start to see more of that. Okay. Thank you very much for coming on. That was interesting. Thanks for having me on. I loved it.